Hi, everyone. Thanks, Chris. Um, so, like I said before, I'm just so excited for this evening, and I just want to welcome you all to our first um, Western Conference for Social Justice collaboration with the Center for, and I'm going to say this wrong, for Faith, Reason, Peace, and Justice, which is just uh, opening up at the at St. At Thomas More College at the University in Saskatchewan. Um, Chris Yurenko is going to be our host for this evening, and he is the director of the center, and he has a very fancy little background that has the logo and um, lets you know how excellent the center is, and we're just so excited to be working with them. Um, so the first thing that I would like to do is to encourage us all to just take a moment um, and I'm going to take my glasses off um, and just to take a moment to recognize the land that we are on. So if we can just take a breath and think about the soil and the land, the vegetation that surrounds us, all the animals, um, the insects, everything that helps to sustain us. And for us to take a moment to recognize the creator's presence in our life. All of us gathered here today acknowledge that our work, the events we carry out, our projects and our lives from coast to coast are on the traditional lands of the diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. We strive to live in peace and harmony with respect and in right relationships, being mindful being mindful of the broken covenants and the past and present wrongdoings that are happening in our nation. By making a land acknowledgement, we are taking part in an act of reconciliation, honoring the land which sustains us and the indigenous heritage and culture that date, dates back over 10,000 years. I'm here in Regina, which is the Treaty 4 land, and it's the traditional land of the Cree, Anishinaabe, Assiniboian, Dakota, Nakota, Lakota, and traditional lands of the Métis. I would invite all of you um, to type in your land acknowledgement in the chat. The chat can be found uh, probably on the bottom of your screen and there's like a little uh, text box. If you click on that, it should open um, a dialogue box and some people have already started. So I thank you in advance for that. Um, so the past three years, I have been on the planning committee for the Western Conference for Social Justice. And a little bit about them. So we are a justice committee of the Assembly of the Western Catholic Bishops. We were founded in 1998. I was a small child back then by the Bishop of Calgary, uh, Frederick Henry. And we are an organization of volunteers and employees across the 22 dioceses and eparchies in the Western Conference of Canada, which includes BC, Cal Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and the three territories. Our purpose is to engage in transforming the communities we live in like yeast. The church is here to make everything, new persons, cultures, social structures, laws, and customs. And so we gather uh, once a year generally, but now because of COVID, we are able to, uh, we've been forced to embrace technology. And so this is one of our first um, meetings in this new format. We gather annually to network, to share resources, to collaborate and to form meaningful relationships and do some professional development. And so this is the first of our uh, new series in reaching out and building community. So I just really want to acknowledge and thank all of you for participating in this. If there are any questions or comments that you have, um, we will have time for questions at the end, but you can feel free to type uh, in the comment box. And if you, as you're going, as we're going through the evening, um, if there are resources or different things that have inspired you or helped you to carry out your work, we'd invite you to share those resources in the chat as well. And at the end of the evening, we'll 
um, be able to save this as the um, planners of this evening and we will go through and create a resource page and be able to send it out and distribute it to everyone who's here and you will in turn be able to share that with others. So I just uh, welcome you all and I will hand it over to Chris. Thanks. So thanks a lot, Tasha. Um, so yeah, we're delighted to have this collaboration. Um, we're really working uh, with the Center for Faith, Reason, Peace and Justice to try to try to find links with the community and to try to make the colleges, um, what the college can offer more relevant and to try to be informed by those community partnerships. And I think this evening is gonna be a really good case of that. So I'll just tell you a little bit about what we're thinking uh, for today. So we're gonna have um, a panel, a panel of four uh, amazing individuals that I'll introduce individually um, as they speak in a second. Uh, then we're gonna have a response from Archbishop Murray Chatlin. Um, and then we're going to break down into, you'll be sucked into small groups. Um, and in those small groups, the idea is that you'll have 20 minutes to introduce yourself, um, then to select someone who will um, craft a question for you, sort of moderate and craft a question for you. Uh, and then we'll come, uh, Tasha's going to explain more about this in the, when, it, when it's time to do so. And then we'll come back together and we'll use those questions that you crafted through the power of dialogue and pose those to the panelists. I think this will give a good variety to the evening and it should be really interesting um, as you'll see due to the quality of the participants that we've recruited. Um, the idea is that the panelists will talk for just over five minutes, five to six minutes um, in initial comments and four of them will talk and then the Archbishop will respond. And we're gonna start with Dr. Peter Baltutis. And he is an Associate Professor of History and Religious Studies and the Catholic Women League, League's Chair for Catholic Studies at St. Mary's University in Calgary. His research focuses on the historical and theological development of Catholic social thought and action in Canada. He also serves on the executive board of the CCHA, which is the Canadian Catholic Historical Association. So without further ado, over to Peter. Great, thank you. Uh, first of all, I wanna say it truly is an honor and a privilege to be here this evening. So thank you for having me. Um, I thought since I'm speaking first, what I would do is give you guys a bit of a bird's eye view about the document as a whole. Hopefully that frames our conversation moving forward. So Fratelli Tutti, uh, or in English on fraternity and social friendship is the third papal encyclical of Pope Francis promulgated in late 2020. Now, like most encyclicals, the title is actually very important. So the title here, Fratelli Tutti, literally means all brothers. And that comes from the admonitions of St. Francis of Assisi back in the early 13th century to his followers. Now, what Pope Francis is doing here is he's propping up St. Francis of Assisi as the exemplar of how to live life of fraternity and social friendship. Specifically, he points out that St. Francis lived a life in right relationship, not only with all people, but also in right relationship with all creation. So that's the model we're called to aspire to. So what Pope Francis wants to really emphasize is that the hallmark of this new Christian society that we're all called to build is we're called to live in a way that transcends boundaries, geographic boundaries, economic boundaries, racial boundaries, religious boundaries, all boundaries are to be transcended. Now, Pope Francis tells us in this document, this social encyclical is part of the broader corpus of official Catholic social teaching. Now, what's curious about papal social encyclicals is that on one hand, they're meant to be timeless, they speak to all people in all circumstances. But on the other hand, they're also very specifically historically rooted in specific historical circumstances. So what exactly is Pope Francis speaking to or addressing in this document? If you're familiar with the pedagogy of Catholic social teaching, Pope Francis walks us through the typical see, judge, act methodology. So first, seeing. So chapter one gives us a very ominous title. It's entitled, Dark Clouds Over a Closed World. It's a bit bleak, um, but it's important because what Pope Francis is saying to us is that oftentimes the conversation is framed around, once COVID is over, we can get back to the way things were. 
or once the situation has resolved itself health-wise, we can go back to how it was. And Pope Francis wants to tell us very clearly, hard no. We don't want to go back to the way things were because the way things were, were quite dysfunctional and unhealthy. In chapter one outlines a whole litany of problems with the world, but they all focus on the common theme of radical individualism. The idea that the person sees themselves as the center of the universe. And as a result, it's me versus everybody else. And he talks about in paragraph 27, how people build up walls around themselves themselves. Not only are these walls political walls of us versus them, but they're also economic walls. And as a result of that, Pope Francis talks about a common theme of his papacy, the throwaway culture. People use and abuse resources, financial, natural, or human, for their own selfish benefit and then discard, when, discard them once they're finished. And Pope Francis says, we need to do better. So we move into number two, which is the idea of judging. And for Pope Francis, he uses the parable of the Good Samaritan as a way to talk about how we judge this situation. And it's appropriate because Jesus himself used this example when he was asked by his followers, well, who is my neighbor? And Pope Francis is trying to say that the situation of the Good Samaritan is just as applicable today as it was 2,000 years ago. He says the weakest of our society, be it the pre-born, the elderly, indigenous communities, racial communities, those with mental and physical disabilities are being discarded to the side. And Pope Francis challenges each of us personally to see where do we see ourselves in this Bible passage. But importantly, he says what makes the Good Samaritan so good, this is paragraph 63, is not so much the financial resources that he gives, but it's the giving of himself. It's taking time to invest himself and in encountering somebody on the margins. That encounter with neighbors becomes the paradigm for the post-COVID world. Step three, Pope Francis talks about now, this is an aspirational section. He talks about building an open world. So a world without borders, one of universal fraternity where people openly give of themselves in service to one another. And he calls it gratuitous service. We give not for personal benefit, but we do what's right because it's right for its own sake. So it's not selfish, it's radically selfless. And finally, part four talks about, and this is about half the document, it's a call to action. My students often complain about papal documents. They're too much theory. Where is the practice? This document gives us some real concrete tips on how we can try and move towards action. So very briefly, a better kind of politics. We need a better way to engage in civil discourse that focuses on the common good, one that combats root causes of poverty, one that builds policies around inclusion, not exclusion. Two, he talks about dialogue and friendship, meaningful ways in which we have to not just pay lip service, but actually listen to each other, come to know and learn from one another. And what's fascinating, in paragraph 220, he gives a model of what that might look like, and he points to indigenous communities as a model for us of how to recover an art form that's been lost. Three, paths of renewed encounter. Pope Francis calls us to mend broken relationships and to truly reconcile. And that means specifically letting go of vicious cycles of revenge. And here he points out why war is a bad idea and specifically why capital punishment is vitriolic and against Catholic teaching. And fourth, in the final point, he talks about the role of religion. He says false religion seeks to divide people and use violence. True religion, he argues, builds bridges, breaks down walls of indifference, and sows seeds of reconciliation. Ultimately, true religion is a sincere and humble worship of our common creator. And what's fascinating is in paragraph 286 and 287 at the very end of the document, the models he gives of what this looks like, yes, he quotes St. Francis of Assisi, and yes, he also props up Blessed Charles de Foucault, but he also moves outside the narrow Catholic tradition and includes other Christians, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He also includes the work of Desmond Tutu. 
But interestingly, he also invites the lived model of non-Christians, specifically the Mahatma Gandhi. So here you have this model of not just Catholics being in dialogue with themselves, but truly engaging with the other. And the last point I want to make is tonight, this panel, I applaud Chris for inviting me here this evening, this panel is what Pope Francis wants. Religion to be not speaking in a silo to other theologians, but religion in dialogue with social scientists, with politicians, and with you people on the ground. So tonight is a great model of what Fratelli Tutti is all about. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Um, so yeah, and that's, thank you, that was an excellent transition. So now I can introduce to you a social scientist um, working on culture, which is one of the areas that Pope Francis emphasizes. So just to use this as an opportunity to tell you a little bit more about the center, one of the things that we're doing in the center is we're housing St. Thomas More's distinctive area programs in Catholic studies, critical perspectives on social justice and the common good, and peace studies. And Susanna Barnes, who I'm going to introduce to you right now, uh, even though she's not an employee of the college. She works for the University of Saskatchewan. She, sh she sits as the University of Saskatchewan representative on two of the advisory committees um, for peace studies and for Catholic studies. So Susanna Barnes is an anthropologist and is currently an assistant professor at the University of Saskatchewan. She has conducted extensive research in Timor-Leste, which some of you may know as East Timor, on customary forms of land and natural resource management, as well as customary healing. Previously, Susanna worked as an advisor to the Timor-Leste Commission for Reception, Truth, and Reconciliation. She has also worked with the Jesuit Refugee Service in Italy, Timor-Leste, and Cambodia. Over to you, Susanna. Thanks so much, Chris, and the Center for Faith, Reason, Peace, and Justice, as well as Tasha and the Western Conference for Social Justice for your invitation. So in my brief presentation, what I'd like to do is reflect in particular on what chapters four and five of Fratelli Tutti ask of us in terms of envisioning and enacting a more just post-pandemic world. So chapter four, a heart open to the whole world. This really resonates with me as an anthropologist. This is what we do. We open our minds, we open our hearts to the world. We seek to understand the beliefs and behaviors of other cultures in terms of the culture in which they are found. To open our hearts to the whole world from an anthropological perspective is to acknowledge that people are different and that these differences reflect the vast range of human potential and possibility that exists in our world. Now, we can respond to this difference as, um, uh, Peter, point, uh, as Peter pointed out, by closing ourselves up um, through ignorance, hate or fear, giving in to what Francis calls a local narcissism, building walls, demonizing those that don't look, act, love or pray like we do. Or we can choose to open ourselves up to open ourselves up and embrace this difference. This cultural encounter, as Francis puts it, is an opportunity for enrichment and the integral development, uh, the integral human development of all. The way Francis conceptualizes this cultural encounter is significant and worth dwelling on. He describes it in terms of an exchange of reciprocal gifts. Gift exchange and the principle of reciprocity is about creating and maintaining relationships. Indeed, anthropologist Mary Douglas suggested a gift that does nothing to enhance solidarity is a contradiction. Cultural encounters based on the principle of reciprocity enable fruitful exchange. They are generative. They create bonds of solidarity between people. So what does opening our hearts to the world look like in practice? Well, I think there are many great examples of fruitful exchanges happening in our communities in different ways. But for those of us who are perhaps, who perhaps don't know where to start or unsure, unsure how to approach the other, here's something else that we can learn from anthropology. A teacher whom I admire, Mike Welsh, challenges his first year anthropology students to adopt an anthropological mindset. This involves three simple things. Ask questions, make connections, 
and try new things. Not only are these three simple things the foundations for studying what it means to be human, they can also be the basis for opening our hearts to the whole world. To speak of reciprocity from an anthropological perspective is also to speak of mutual obligations. Right at the start of chapter four, Francis clearly states, if the conviction that all human beings are brothers and sisters is not to remain an abstract idea, we need to see things in a new light and to develop new responses. Much of what Francis writes regarding the need for openness to cultural exchange is meant to address particular anxieties created by the effects of globalization and migration in the so-called global north. A situation which he stresses ideally ought to be avoided, but has come about due to poverty and structural injustices which prevent individuals from developing their potential and beauty. One way unnecessary migration might be avoided, he continues, is by creating in countries of origin the conditions needed for a dignified life and integral development. He writes, we need to attain a global order which can increase and give direction to international cooperation for the development of all peoples in solidarity. So here is where mutual obligations come into play again and where we can take action. In 1970, Canada committed to spending 0.7% of its GDP on international development aid. 50 years on, Canada has yet to reach this goal. While Canada often likes to see itself on an international stage in the image of the Good Samaritan, the reality is somewhat different. Despite pledging to increase Canada's international development assistance every year, um, towards 2030, the current government actually provides less aid than the Harper government did. And seeking to appeal to what Francis calls narrow forms of nationalism, political leaders of the opposition argue that foreign aid should be cut further. As Francis reminds us, the true worth of different countries of our world is measured by their ability to think not simply as a country, but as part of a larger human family. Francis argues that we, and also our nations, should be guided by the principle of gratuitousness, the ability to do things simply because they're good in themselves, without concern for personal gain or recompense. Now, does that mean that we, have, we should abandon the principles of reciprocity and mutual obligation that underpin gift exchange, those things that I spoke about earlier? I don't think so. I think that what Francis is asking us to address here are the power imbalances inherent in the notion of aid as gift. Marcel Mauss, a sociologist who anthropologists like to claim as their own, argued that it was the expectation of return that created asymmetrical, uneven relationships between giver and receiver. Francis cautions us life without fraternal gratuitousness becomes a form of frenetic commerce in which we're constantly weighing up what we give and what we get back in return. So what can we do? Or what are we being to asked to do here? I believe that civil society has a critical role to play. We can support and create consensus around initiatives that tackle poverty that do not expect anything in return. That is, initiatives that are not simply aimed at promoting Canada's strategic, military, political or economic interests. Initiatives that are not done to the poor, but alongside following their lead. Without policies and programmes that are with and of the poor, not only for the poor, Francis argues, democracy atrophies. It turns into a mere word, a formality. So to conclude, I hope this anthropological reflection has helped draw out some of the main lessons of Fratelli Tutti. And for me, the most important one is that we are all interconnected. And collectively, we must understand that collectively we make the world. Understanding this helps us understand that collectively we can also make the world differently. 
and we can work on opening our hearts and our minds towards a flourishing of all peoples in creation. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Susanna, for that anthropological reflection. Um, now we're turning to another social scientist um, or political studies. I, I imagine he would identify as a social scientist. And this is Dr. David McGrain. He was born and raised in Moose Jaw and completed his PhD in political science at Carleton University in Ottawa. He's currently professor of political studies at St. Thomas More College and at the University of Saskatchewan. His research interests include social democracy, political theory, political marketing, elections, and voter behavior. He's published almost 40 academic books, journals, articles, and book chapters. His latest research is the new NDP, Modernization, or pardon me, Moderation, Modernization, and Political Marketing um, from the University of British Columbia Press in 2019. That book won the Donald Smiley Prize awarded by the Canadian Political Science Association to the best book on Canadian government and politics. Dr. McGrain has been active in his community as a member of the City of Saskatoon's Environmental Advisory Committee, member of the Board of Directors of the Saskatoon Open Door Society, Chair of the Political Action Committee of the Saskatoon and District Labour Council, and President of the Saskatchewan NDP. He's also a Policy Fellow of the Broadbent Institute, as well as being the past president of the Prairie Political Science Association. So with all those qualifications, I turn things over to Dave. Well, thanks so much, Chris, and, and thanks so much to the, um, the new Center for Faith, Reason, uh, Faith, Reason, Peace, and Justice. I got used to saying that. Very excited to have that host at STM. Um, so I guess as a political scientist um, and a political activist, I did read this encyclical more as a political treatise, um, really as a work of political philosophy. And I struggled whether to say this or not, but I, I, I couldn't help when I'm reading this encyclical to ask myself repeatedly, is the Pope a socialist? Uh, that just came up over and over again. I don't know if that's hearsay. That could be hearsay. I'm not exactly sure. I'll leave that to the Archbishop, if that's heretical or not. I'm not sure. For some reason, I have some sort of like a, a lack of comfort in calling the Pope a socialist. But what I can say is that, you know, as a political scientist, I have read a lot of socialist political philosophy and uh, Fratelli to Tutti definitely picks up on a lot of those themes. Um, so my reading of the encyclical, um, really over and over again, there's these two themes that I think come out, uh, for me anyway, um, and those are the themes of collectivism and cosmopolitanism. And for me, what Francis is doing in a lot of ways um, is sort of uh, making a contrast between collectivism and cosmopolitanism on the one hand, which he's advocating for, and on the other hand, what he's advocating against, which is a very xenophobic type of nationalism, a very free market type of liberalism. So to me, reading this more as, as a political treatise, I thought the, the strategy was pretty clear um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a work of political philosophy. What I think he's saying, this is my own interpretation of, of his political philosophy, um, is that a post-COVID world needs more collectivism and less free market liberalism, and that a post-COVID world needs more cosmopolitanism and less xenophobic nationalism. And I'll just put that in the chat there. I apologize for a lot of isms in there. I just realized that. Political scientists have a real addiction to isms. We just, like, we just throw them out all the time. It's just a, it's a, it becomes a problem. Everything's an ism, right? Uh, McGrainism, uh, STMism, everything's an ism. But you'll see that that, that is part of, uh, I guess, my training as a political scientist. So let me first then uh, explain a bit what I mean by his um, collectivism, um, and then I'll move on to the uh, cosmopolitanism. Um, well, he repeats out, he repeats um, a number of times that the overriding political duty of a Catholic is to care for others. Care is a big word that comes out in this encyclical for me. It doesn't matter if you know the other person, it doesn't matter if the other person uh, lives in, in a different place than you. It doesn't matter if the other person is of a different ethnicity than you. God calls you to care for that person, just like the Good Samaritan. And this is the heart of Francis's collectivist view of society, that we are all brothers and sisters, uh, and that we all need to care for each other because we are interdependent on each other. And the metaphor that comes up when he, when he talks about brothers and sisters is a metaphor that comes out of socialist political philosophy, that is that society is a family. And he sees society as a family, which is a very famous um, uh, socialist 
uh, political philosophy metaphor that gets reflected even the trade union movement, right? When we call each other brothers and sisters. So I see this encyclical as a real statement of values. He doesn't really get into detailed public policy proposals, um, but you know, if, if I can imagine a public policy proposal that would reflect this kind of collectivist view of society, it would be something like pharmacare, where government provides prescription drugs uh, for all of those uh, in need of such drugs. And he contrasts this sort of very collectivist vision of society with what I will call free market liberalism. Um, that is a type of liberalism allows the market to operate relatively free from government intervention. And he uh, talks about how this free market uh, liberalism results in wealth inequality, in selfishness, in poverty, uh, the complete opposite of what he is, he's advocating. The second theme then that I found um, in the encyclical was one of cosmopolitanism. That is this idea that human beings on earth are all members of one single family that we're all, mem of, we're all members of one single community, that we all live in a global village of sorts, right? We're all related to each other. And so I think Francis is calling on Catholics to be open to the entire world, to dialogue and cooperate with the entire world. Dialogue and cooperation comes up a lot in this. And he, and he really dislikes this idea of isolating ourselves in our own nations or isolating ourselves in our own small geographical areas. So he talks about intercultural exchange, uh, he talks about risk countries welcoming immigrants and refugees. Uh, he talks about countries, countries cooperating with each other through multilateralism to create more peace, create more justice. Uh, he gives a nod to the UN uh, and how the UN should be used uh, to create more peace and justice in the world. Uh, and he really then takes aim at that sort of xenophobic nationalism of people like Trump, and I can name others as well, these sort of strong man, uh, as they are called in the political science letters, these sort of strong man politicians who want to close their countries off from the world, who want to blame immigrants for their country's problems, that want to pursue the selfish interests of their nations um, at the expense of the well-being of other countries. So just to end off then, um, you know, if, if we were to think about the question of sort of the post-COVID world versus the pre-COVID world and ask ourselves, you know, what would be one thing that we really would want to change uh, between the post-COVID world and the pre-COVID world? Something that'd be different in that post-COVID world. I guess following um, uh, Francis, what I would say anyway of, of something that I'd like to see different uh, in, uh, in the post-COVID world as opposed to the pre-COVID world, and I'll put in the chat as well here, um, is that I would say more solidarity with others in our own society and more solidarity with others living outside of Canada. Um, and if COVID's taught us anything, it's taught us that you know, no person is an island. Uh, we are uh, interdependent on each other. Uh, we have to cooperate and take care of each other. That's the only way we've gone through this pandemic so far. It's the only way we're going to get forward in the future. So um, this is the kind of lesson I hope that we don't forget uh, once we get all the vaccinations in everybody's arms. Uh, so with that, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll end my remarks and I look forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you, Dave. So last and certainly not least, and I was told it was a, a brilliant idea to put Georgina last in the panel um, to give her the final word. Uh, Georgina Jolibois is a Denise Lynn woman from Northern Saskatchewan. She's well grounded in her community and cultural roots in Lolosh. Georgina has an education in political studies, achieving her bachelor's degree from the University of Saskatchewan with a minor in indigenous studies. For over a decade, from 2000, and three into two th until 2015, Ms. Jolibois served as mayor of La Lush, overseeing many challenging times, such as the forest fires in 2015. Following her tenure as mayor, G Georgina served as member of parliament, being the first MP to speak Dennis Salen in the House of Commons. Notably in her first term of in federal office, Georgina was able to have legislation of a national holiday for indigenous people, make it to the Senate of Canada, Unfortunately, that legislation was unsuccessful as there was other legislation heard at the same time that was perceived as contentious. While in federal office, Georgina served on many committees, including the Indigenous Languages Act Committee and was a supporter of UNDRIP, Bill C-262. Um, and in 2018, Georgina won the Parliamentarian of the Year uh, for her hard work and dedication to her community. Following the 2019 federal election, Michelle Livois felt the strong need to continue serving her community. She returned to civic politics and once again is currently serving as mayor of La Lush. Through her work in civic politics, national politics and community support, Georgina is an inspiration 
of young people and especially for young women. So over to you, Georgina. Thank you very much. Merci, Jose. Bien, Jose. Good evening, everyone. My name is Georgina Jolibois. I am a Denise Ufina woman born and raised in Laloche. Before I proceed, I want to thank Ms. Gertrude Rampre for inviting me and having this privilege and honor uh, for sitting in a panel uh, facilitated by my very own bishop. Bishop Catelyn is a respected bishop well loved not only here in the community throughout the whole north and he is instrumental in some of the work that i'm doing throughout my life i've been reflecting quite a bit especially now having read this material and gone through it the wording reflection i looked back before i proceed any further i want to describe yes here is a university setting and here we have different speakers and using different words and describing. We as human beings are horrible in making, making categories and fittings of the words to fit here, describes here, be here. And we as indigenous people find that as a barrier, by the way, because it becomes to me and to my understanding, the way I understand it, and to the people I represent and to many indigenous people that I've worked with throughout Canada and continue to work with. It is about indigenous people. When we're talking about indigenous people as a person, it is about me, my life, my family, my community, and people I can connect with and how we can, our views, our perspectives, and how we can move forward in solving some of the issues faced before us. It is always about when I hear about the word isms or I hear about the anthro, the sociological or other descriptions, it makes it difficult for me to connect with. And it is also true for many indigenous people. There are many indigenous scholars who struggle with that very same thing as well. After having read the book and reflected, and by the way, I really did enjoy the book, and it helped me to reflect and to put things in perspective and looking at the meaning of life i often think about the word meaning of life and the way my world shaped is about growing up with the oblates of the missionaries the priests who played a critical role in lalash the late father matthew and others as well as the the gray nuns who were here what they model and how they treated us when I was here, when we were growing up as children. The, the underlying words that they, that I saw from those two, the gray nuns and the oblates, were to serve and to help so that we can help and that we can live and, and enjoy life. The word I, the words that I use in my perspectives and the words and the work that I have done and the reflections that I have done. The word public service. Looking at the book, there's many similarities and many ways how we can uh, make life better, improve the quality of life for all indigenous people in not only Northern Saskatchewan, in Saskatchewan and in Canada. Again, improve the quality of life. We as indigenous people often think about the quality of life and we want the same thing as people who live in Saskatoon and people who live anywhere else that get to enjoy life. We want good quality services. We have our own views and yes, we are very keen in contributing to solving the problems. So the words public service me carries a whole lot for me. Throughout my career and throughout my life and throughout the readings that I have done, it is about the human connection. Here in this time and age, we are challenged because of COVID. COVID has broken many things for us, the connections that we would make with our friends and families and the communities and everyone else. But we as Indigenous people here often go further and pray. Prayer and reflection is a daily occurrence for us 
here and we have a different perspective. My mom every day guides us in the way so we got to pray. We got to pray the rosary. The meaning of rosary plays a significant role among us. The book, when I turn to the, to the section where think outside, outside of self, when I reflect on the journeys that I have done and when I look back and look at ways how to think about the word reconciliation, pre-COVID for indigenous people was an experiences, history were very painful and continues to be very painful. COVID, I'm hoping there are many changes that are occurring and building relationships and, and improving circumstances for indigenous people moving forward. And then after COVID, it would be an excellent opportunity after COVID to help all of us play a critical role in reshaping and rewriting the history and starting afresh and really truly begin about the meaning of reconciliation. What does reconciliation mean? It means something to me entirely as indigenous woman. I was in the House of Commons when, when my, my former colleague, Romeo Saganesh, introduced his under legislation. And I was there to support him all the way through. And it was a remarkable journey to have gone through that with him. And to this day, still having that relationship and having to gain an understanding about what it means to be indigenous and having some rights. My own work, the work that I've done in the House of Commons, indigenous people play a critical role in Canada, but due to systemic racism and systemic of any kind, all the barriers place us down. That has to stop. And for those in the future who those who want to work with indigenous people, please look at yourself, understand yourself. Do you judge? Why do I judge? Examine. And this is where someone like the bishop is critical to me because he's able to relate to us as human beings and yet he's able to do his remarkable work as a bishop. And families, young people, and people of all age can relate to him. It is about relationships, but being able to relate. And that's how I reflect on the book. I think about Mother Teresa, Dalai Lama, though he's not Catholic, but others, and building relationships and building hope. How can we build hope for young people and in Canada and strengthening our ties and our spiritual connections? and get rid of barriers. So with that, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Georgina, and thank you for um, reminding us to stay grounded in our dialogue when we try to build those deep relationships that you're talking about. Um, so Georgina has already started to introduce um, Archbishop Murray Chatlin. He's originally from Saskatoon. He was named as Bishop of Mackenzie Fort Smith in 2007 and installed as Archbishop of Kuwait and the Paw um, on the same day as the inauguration of Pope Francis in Rome in 2013. He serves as co-chair of Our Lady of Guadalupe Circle, which is the Catholic Church's Coalition for Advancing Reconciliation with Indigenous Peoples. So if you recall, uh, Archbishop Murray will offer a response uh, to the panelists, and then we'll pass it over to Tasha. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chris. Uh, just uh, impressed with our speakers. Uh, very uh, good uh, presentations and I thought Peter you did a very good uh, description of fertility in just a few minutes. Uh, one of the lines that really uh, struck me was we need to do better. That I think that's just in the Pope's frustration and uh, his desire and care is that we need to do better and I think all of us are on this call because we share in that so uh, so I thought that was a, a, an important line. And Susanna, I appreciated the anthropological perspective. And, and I think so much of what uh, Georgina is talking about is that ability and openness to embrace the other, that uh, we don't see the differences of other cultures and peoples as a threat, but that our response is um, of desire to learn. And uh, I thought that 
your expression, uh, you highlighted local narcissism, narcissism is something we've seen played out in politics so much lately that uh, that is, is really a, a painful thing for our leadership. And so that we do things because they're the good things, they're the right things. I think that's a, a simple but important uh, message that uh, you were communicating there. Uh, David, uh, I think that uh, you have no problems calling Francis a socialist. Uh, maybe not to narrow him to that, it's certainly not heresy. Uh, Catholic social teaching is very uh, connected to socialism and they uh, probably have informed each other throughout their, their development. And so uh, again, your line of solidarity and interdependence. I think is really important that all that unpacking of solidarity. I'll just give a shout out to development and peace. I think that development and peace models uh, 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 an accompanying uh, solidarity uh, in their style. That's very important. And finally, Georgina, I was blushing a little bit there, Georgina, anyway. Uh, uh, anyway, I really appreciated uh, your perspective. And just, you know, helping us to realize what a different direction the Indigenous mindset comes from. And uh, that we don't sort of just presume that everybody sees things a, a similar way, that there is a really different ways of seeing things. And the importance of relationships. And I think uh, an important uh, part of your presentation was, how can we build hope? Not just for Indigenous people but for all of our people, uh, how can we build a real hope? Uh, I think that reflects in, um, you know, that belief in God and the belief in our collective abilities to make changes. And so anyway, I just, those would be my comments uh, from our good presenters. Thank you so much, Bishop Murray. Uh, so it is at this point in our evening that we wanna give you a little bit of time to uh, engage in dialogue, to do some active listening, and to reflect uh, in very short order on what you've heard today. So uh, you're going to be placed into breakout rooms that would probably be a, between four and six people in a breakout room. Uh, when you get there, please choose one facilitator slash reporter, and their task will be um, first in introduce yourselves, and then um, based on what you have heard and what stirred your hearts, um, what's one question, only one, <laughs> that you would like to ask the panelists? And so the facilitator reporters duty will be to write that down and then to bring that forward on behalf of your group. So thank you everyone and I think we're all pretty much back right now. Um, so now we're going to move to the, the portion of the evening where the panelists are going to um, be able to answer some of the questions that we pose and as I said to my group um, just while all the questions are coming in in the chat that I'll then I'll start curating I'll try to just summarize a little bit of what we talked about um, as the background for the first question for the panelists which we're hoping Georgina will answer last but also inviting other panelists to consider so in Laudato Si Pope Francis talks about um, indigenous communities as not being just one minority amongst others but that we're called to be, um, that, that they should be, then that we're called to achieve the situation where there are principal dialogue partners. Uh, we talked quite a bit about um, how to think about a way um, in some of this language that Francis talks about in terms of dreaming, of coming out on the other end of COVID so that um, our indigenous brothers and sisters and their communities are in a better place on the other side of COVID. Um, in that in that idea of uh, principal dialogue partners, almost a preferential option for Indigenous people. Um, this, the context for this question is that we're dreaming of worlds that are possible. Um, so it's not just a dream, but this sort of dreaming of a grounded reality that ought to be. And we're interested in, in um, Georgina's challenge to some of my academic brothers and sisters in terms of their language use. 
um, so that the isms don't become divisions. And we're also interested in the things that have come into focus because of COVID, uh, generosity, um, moments of grace and giving, et cetera. So in all that spirit, um, we're asking the panelists and we're asking Georgina to have the, the final word on this. Um, what can we do to ensure uh, proactively that our indigenous brothers and sisters come out in a better place uh, on the other side of COVID? So who's brave amongst the settler academics to go first? I will bravely take an initial attempt at it, at least to get the ball rolling. And I suspect that the question that you're asking, Chris, I think our group had a very similar one. I think I'm seeing the comments in the um, chat box. I think that these are a lot of similar questions people have. So hopefully um, I, this, this, this will be a start a conversation amongst us as panelists. Um, I think really to narrowly specifically look at indigenous communities, um, one of the things that came up in our, in our panel, our small group discussion, that's worth mentioning here, is that Pope Francis really wants to say that as much as there is a imperialism that's happening in the world in terms of you know, military exploitation, colonialism, there's also a cultural imperialism. And Pope Francis pushes back strongly against that and says we need to protect and preserve local cultures and local communities. So there's an emphasis that this is something we have a moral obligation to do. Um, how one does that, I think um, in chapter six, for example, Pope Francis talks about this idea of dialogue and friendship. And I think, and I'll speak for myself, um, coming from Eastern Canada, moving out to Western Canada, um, I did not have opportunities in Eastern Canada to interact very much with indigenous populations. Coming out to Western Canada, they're much more prevalent. And that was really interesting to me. And I think that even though they're more prevalent, there's a reluctance to even know how to do that from someone who's not part of that community. But I think what Pope Francis is calling us to do is to engage in dialogue and engage in friendship with those communities. So in many ways, it's trying to not see indigenous communities as somehow the other, but trying to actually make personal connections with those communities. Because once you have those personal connections, then you, it's hard to demonize or create the other with something that you actually know. It's easier to say it's that group of people over there, but once you actually engage in rich conversation and begin to have those encounters, those barriers get torn down. So I think the initial step is to try to find ways to look to make those personal acquaintances with those other communities. Um, how one does that, I think um, we can look back to the point that I think um, that Sarah gave us initially, uh, sorry, Susanna gave us, I wrote down those three things. Um, one is asking questions, two, making connections, and then three, trying new things. I think that's actually a great life mantra to have. So I think it begins with not assuming we understand what First Nations think about things. We have to first actually ask them if they think about it. Two, make those personal connections. And then three, um, try new things. I mean, I don't want to monopolize the time too much, but for myself, my university, has a program, uh, we have an indigenous um, officer that helps create these experiences. So for me, it was the experience of trying to take part in a sweat lodge, listening to a First Nations elder, um, taking part in some of these ceremonies has helped to demystify a lot of that for me and I'm much wiser for it. So I think those experiences of trying to engage the other without trying to culturally appropriate what they're doing but actually approach it on their terms is at least a good first step in that process. Those are my initial two cents. I would, I would just add just to Peter's point, um, just in like 10, 10 seconds or so, just that um, I, I love the idea of the dialogue and that's what I thought of too, but I think there is some sort of end point to the dialogue. And what I would say is the end point of the dialogue with indigenous people and settlers is to create some sort of form of solidarity with indigenous people. Uh, that would be the end point. Now that's not an easy thing to do, and how do we do that? That's that's I'm going to leave that uh, aside for the moment. But I would hope that post COVID, um, that we can really engage in the type of dialogue that builds solidarity between ourselves um, as settlers and our indigenous uh, brothers and sisters. Um, Chris, I won't add much more 
than what Peter and, and David said, but just going back to what Georgina said afterwards, what, what we do know is that we can't go back to what it was pre-COVID. That is not an option. And so we have to imagine something better. And, and I think that it's possible by opening these pathways, that, that notion of reciprocal gifts and of entering into relationships of, of, of reciprocity and mutual obligation. Um, but it, 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 it must be done in the, in the right way, I suppose. So is it my turn? Yes? Okay. Thank you for this opportunity. The way I understand it, how when I'm, because I had had, I have degree and I've lived in Ottawa and with the work I've done, I've lived in Saskatoon. I can live among settlers and I can do really well in urban settings and I, and I can do that. The way I've come to understand is how can I relate to and, and adapt to, and for my personal self, the, the actually the friend, uh, the prayer. Um, in my meetings, when I start a lot of meetings here and in, in many places in northern Saskatchewan, we use that prayer quite a bit. How the prayer helps me about how I can, if there's anger, I don't want it. I, yes, as a human being, I get it. In, I will feel angry and I will. So I, I work on separating that. And if there's anger, how, how can I think about bringing love and hope and making that person feel it doesn't matter who and what it is. And when I'm able to be in that frame and that mindset, I can adapt and I can be in that space and make the connection and build the relationship. And here in the community, in the work that I am doing, and that's what we're trying, that's what I try to do on a daily basis with various, for example, the relationships. I always say every relationship is important. It doesn't matter what, what, with what agency. If it's a professional, it could be the RCMP officer. Many RCMP officers who end up in Northern Saskatchewan are fairly young. Mind you, that's everywhere in Canada, but they're fa fairly young in an experience. Yes, they're a police officer, but they also need people to help them do their job. And so that's how I am able to relate. There's so many people who can make that connection. Uh, and the church, the Catholic church to the Christian church that we have in the community, again, how are we able to make that connection and do the things that we are doing collectively? Again, David, we use the word collectively. Everybody's in it. And this COVID, during this COVID situation here in Lalage and the approach that we are taking, we know that the majority of people who are home from young and old, there are many who are following precautions and are staying home as much as they can. There are those that break the rules, but those who are home, there's a lot of disconnection. So we, the community, what we're doing is taking a different approach and thinking, how can we engage with them while they are at home through social media, through the, the radio, through the local channels and various means that we have. And so what we did, we were able to acquire funding. And this is where uh, the, the Catholic women's group that said how they can help. If there's funding, fund, give it to some communities, to various Catholic churches or organizations. And again, to make a long story short, to engage to encourage getting tested, to encourage the vaccine rollout. There's no vaccine for the kids, but for the adult population who's afraid. So we're taking the raffle approach and how to engage them so that they, so that we can teach them about the vaccine, so that we can teach them about self-care and vice versa and ways to stay engaged. And we hope that after COVID's done, we can continue with that kind of approach. And again, it's that relationship building. And regardless of where we are in Canada, where we're even in the world because of internet 
and social media, we can make that connection. Like this evening, we're, we're talking through Zoom, and yet we're, we're in different provinces for some of us. And the critical ro ro work that we are all doing in making that connection, I think. Thank you, Georgina. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm going to try to combine a couple of questions. We'll probably only have time for two more questions, it, lo it would look like. Um, so a lot of the questions have to do with this idea of impact starting from the local level. Uh, we will end with a point about international solidarity and how you can support that um, this evening. But maybe taking that starting point, starting um, with groups like CWL groups, starting with, with the individual, um, thinking of how people are feeling very introverted and alone, uh, even when they don't want to be feeling that at the, at the moment. Um, what's, what do you see from this, this reading that you've done of Laudato Si and from your perspective, what do you see as something that we can do to be in, impactful either as groups or as individuals? And maybe we could start with Susanna to put her on the spot. <laughs> Thanks for putting me on the spot there, um, Chris. Um, I was just thinking through as I was listening to you and it, it came back to something that I've been thinking about in terms of creating consensus. How do we create consensus uh, within civil society broadly, but within our own communities, within um, the, the, the communities represented here? How do we build consensus around um, the projects that we can that we can work on together. So how do we reach out to those projects and how do we dis discern the best way to, to enter into partnerships with uh, local organizations, whether they be in Canada or whether they be in, in Colombia or, or um, Ghana, for example. It's how do we create consensus about the sort of projects um, that require our assistance and, um, and create consensus that you know, that we need to support uh, these, these, these types of projects. So, yeah, sorry if that doesn't answer the question necessarily, but it's just something that I've been thinking about in terms of how to, to, to rally around certain, certain important uh, projects. If, if I could just jump in, Chris, really quick here, just in terms of the, at the parish level, um, I think study, doing what we're doing tonight and studying Francis, um, whether it be this encyclical or another encyclical, or maybe a summary of this encyclical might be better <laughs> instead of the 100 pages, but um, using Francis as a gateway to talk about, uh, you know, uh, social Catholic teaching and those types of, of things, I think is actually a good, a, a good way to start, to at least start out, out talking about these types of issues within our own church, within our own parishes. So I think Francis's, his, his words and what he stands for is a good starting point for us. Maybe Georgina. The way, you know, I'm, I'm thinking my own and Bishop Murray is again, very critical in, in in how we do things here in the community and throughout the Northern Saskatchewan within the diocese. Uh, the parish priest that we have here, he's, he is of East India. He, I always say when I'm describing Father Robert, he is one of the nicest men I know. <laughs> he loves to smile. He greets you with a smile. He's in the community. He's talking to people. He's learning the language. And what that allows the experiences that I that I see so far, young people, when they see him, they love the smile that he gives, the one Father Robert gives. And the again, and this is where Bishop Murray plays a critical role again, the ability to come together and feel that connection through prayer. And again, through prayer, through the Catholic faith, and through when we pray through using the medicine wheel, the, the creator. And again, it's about building that connection and how can we make, how can I make it better for someone to give them hope under the circumstances that we are in. And when I was in Ottawa and I've heard my friend Nikki Ashton say quite a bit, the word solidarity, and that because it's a foreign word to me, and it took me a while to understand it, now I understand it. And I'm thinking, yes, 
there is a way how we can make that connection. We have so many, and, and I don't like the word socialist, by the way, David. <laughs> and <laughs> so the way I look at it again is to how can we make life better, to improve quality of life. And I think all of us, all of us human beings can relate to that. I want my life to have a good quality of even going to the grocery store to buy fruits and vegetables, to even going for a short walk so that I can uh, have some strength and, and even going to have the courage to visit the local health center. You know, I, th I was thinking a lot about this COVID time during time. I have one brother who is slowly recovering from COVID. He is one brother that I would, that I wouldn't, none of us would have thought that he would get COVID because he is one of those public servants within the government, but he's there to help in the community. And he's physically strong and he's physically active and he was always healthy. For four and a half weeks, he needed oxygen to breathe. He's slowly getting better. And from what I've seen and what that does is that COVID has allowed many learning experiences regardless of how painful the situation is and moving forward and we as indigenous people know what it feels like to be traumatized but we also know what it's like to be in a place of having that good quality of life from all aspects we know what it's like to hold down a very good paying job to be an academic to be a school teacher and very and, and we are getting there and so again, that connection in Canada is making a slow effort. And we will someday, I have faith and hope that we will get someday get to that reconciliation part. Uh, St. Thomas More College is, is demonstrating that. And by even holding this event this evening, and David is that then uh, in, in his world is demonstrating that also. And that building, all of you play a critical role we know indigenous people i know many settlers again building that relationship and we got to keep doing that and i that's how i see jesus doing it and saw it and then reading and reflecting mother Teresa and others then so we got to keep learning and keep trying and never give up so thank you If I could just add uh, my two cents as well to this question, I think in seeing the chat here as well, it seems like, you know, questions always, what do we do with this? If we intellectually think this makes sense, our faith compels us to act, what do we do next? That's the question I often struggle with. And I think to me, the way I circle around it in my own mind is to borrow a phrase from my former um, bishop when I was in Toronto, uh, Cardinal Collins, he used to talk about the head, the heart, and the hands. And I like that sort of Trinitarian formula. It's very Catholic, head, heart, and hands. So I think for the head, number one is reading these documents to me was, this is my third time reading this document from cover to cover. I found it profoundly inspirational, but as was mentioned, I think by David and others, it's long. Like Pope Francis is not very succinct. If you want to get bite-sized doses of Francis's inspiration, you may know on YouTube, Pope Francis has a channel called The Pope Video. And every month he issues a 60 second video. This is what I'm thinking about. This is what I'm praying for this month. And for me, I subscribe on YouTube to The Pope Video. It shows up and it's just a good reminder, oh, I should be aware of this around the global church. So keeping ourselves informed is important. Um, the, that's the head portion. The heart portion is, you know, it's one thing to intellectually understand something, it's something else to actually want to care about it and get involved in the issue. And I think for me, that comes down to really this personal encounter once again. So I think it's actually important to try and find ways to connect with people, to not see them as numbers, but as individuals. And that's how we really create that fraternal connection. Um, and one way we can do that, I think, is by, number one, engaging in communities of support just like this. Uh, to me, tonight, this is so heartening because oftentimes in my own parish, in my own diocese, I feel like the lone voice in the wilderness because I think about 
and pray about these issues. So to find like-minded people, I see people on tonight's call like Carol and MT, to find people like them and like you all, this gives me hope. So to find communities of support to strengthen yourself. And then once you have those communities, to then go out and that becomes the hands portion. And I would say, I would challenge each of you in your own prayer time or in your own meditation time, find an issue that you connect with. Um, Mother Teresa was once asked, they say, Mother Teresa, you're such an inspiration, but we can't all pick up and move to Calcutta. What should we do? And Mother Teresa simply said, find your own Calcutta. There are poor and marginalized in our backyard, in our communities. So the question is to discern carefully, how is God calling you towards a certain group or a certain activity or a certain charity or a certain NGO? And then to commit yourself to say, I will work with that NGO to make this problem begin to become ameliorated in some way, shape or form. And then lastly, and perhaps Georgina might have some more insights on this, in my experience, politicians need to be our servants. We can lament bad politics, but I would encourage us to reach out to your city council member or reach out to your alderman or reach out to your MLA or your MPP or your MP in Ottawa and say, these issues are important to me. And I, if you represent my voice, where do we stand on these issues? And admittedly, that takes a lot of courage. I mean, I have my doctorate and I'm so nervous calling my politicians, but I'm slowly getting better at it. So I think it's on us to hold our politicians accountable. If they want our vote, we try and demand action on some of these issues. And the more we can bug them or remind them that these are pressing concerns, I think that is helpful. So those are at least my initial thoughts on ways you can start putting these abstract ideas into reality. Hopefully that was helpful. Thank you, Peter. And of course, you could also become the politicians because good people like Georgina and David um, have showed us. Okay, so I'm going to try, this will be the last question that I ask, and then we do have sort of a five minute closing that uh, Tasha will take us through that gives us an action item as well. So I hope you can stick around for that. Um, and I'm going to try to get in not only the questions that you could see, but also several that have been messaged to me privately from certain folks. So let's think about, and I'm going to start with David on this one, just so he knows, so he can get ready. Um, so let's think about this point that's come up in different ways this evening, and that's this idea that things can't and should not be the same after COVID, that there, there are cracks in the way our society has been organized and our lack of reconciliation, et cetera, that have, that have shone through because of COVID. Um, Katie says very beautifully, COVID is a, is a, uh, a chance for a social reset. So thinking of that, a lot of the questions have to do that we haven't got to yet have to do with how we work across boundaries. Uh, work across boundaries um, to build up the culture of encounter, work across boundaries for reconciliation, work across boundaries to connect communities that are otherwise unconnected, and also to work across cultures. So thinking of that context, how do we encourage each other uh, in the type of the good work that you have mentioned this night um, and that you as panelists have mentioned, that you have highlighted as panelists, how do we encourage each other in this good work? And starting with Dave. Well, that, that's a great question. I mean, how, how do we how do we encourage each other? I mean, I mean, the, the one thing that I found, so I, I mean, I was a, a, a budding politician, uh, you know, unfortunately lost in the last provincial election by 259 votes and I've uh, been involved in politics quite a bit and, and all these organizations, um, political organizations. The one thing I found is to encourage other people is to compliment them. Sometimes we don't compliment each other enough. This sounds a bit, bit banal, but sometimes, you know, we don't, we don't, we don't go and we say to each other, you know, listen, uh, Georgina or Peter or Susanna, I think you're a great person. I think you have lots of talent. I think you can contribute in this way. And then so, kind of suggest to these people how to contribute, how to, um, you know, how to, how to become leaders. Because unfortunately, sometimes in our society, and, and even, you know, the Pope talks about this a bit in, in his in the cyclical where he talks about being very isolated, people who are leaders don't often think of themselves as leaders. So try to encourage others to be leaders. I think, and I've tried that various times in, in my political career, and it, it's, it's something that is really useful for the world as a whole, uh, but also a very fulfilling thing for yourself, because when, when you do kind of encourage someone else, someone else to be a leader, to become a leader, you feel really great about the world as well. So I think encouraging others to take on leadership roles, even though they might not think of themselves as leaders, 
um, I think is something that's quite important. Peter, would you care to weigh in? Yeah, I think um, I think one of the challenges is we need to find other people to be kind of coalition building, if you will. Um, so specifically, what I mean by that is trying to find other like-minded people who may be in your faith-based settings or may not be. So, for example, um, you know, in Calgary, there's a group I've been working with called the Calgary Alliance for the Common Good, where it's a group of not just Christian, but all different kinds of faith communities and coming together with um, things like labor unions and coming together with community associations and trying to say, how can we now multiply our efforts around issues that we all think are important for the common good? Um, so I think sometimes it's intimidating to be on your own. And, and so it's important to try to reach out to others that share your views and then multiply your voice by working together as a team. And I think, as I mentioned earlier, we also need our own support network. So trying to find other like-minded people, uh, and that can be sometimes um, prayer groups. I think prayer, obviously that's extremely important, but also trying to find, um, for me, honestly, granted I'm a church historian. So even looking at heroic models of people, we have a tremendous litany of saints to draw upon through a variety of circumstances. And even in Canada, we have a wealth of inspirational stories that can inspire us. So I think sometimes it's trying to find inspiration where you can um, from the living model of people who came before us or are in our midst right now, many of which are in this room with me right today. So I think um, trying to find other people to inspire us is important and finding communities of support. And Susanna, if you could offer a few thoughts on this, this how to encourage each other in this good work. Sure. I mean, I think there's a great line in, in Fratelli Tutti and Pope Francis says, you know, don't sit around waiting for politicians to do everything. He says, you know, there's a really important role for civil society here. And so just echoing some of the things that, that, that Peter and David have been saying is, you know, it, it's then incumbent on us to sort of, to move out of our comfort, comfort zone, to do those three things that I said, ask questions, make connections and try new things. And sort of uh, take that step, that first step towards uh, uh, the other and towards building up these coalitions, towards building up consensus around key issues. So yeah, that, that, that would be what I would say. And then Georgina, for, for your closing insight, please. Thank you very much. And again, I want to thank Gertrude and Bishop Murray and, and you guys uh, for a remarkable experience. The words again, I always, often when I get stuck for thinking too hard and, and then a number of things coming to my mind, two simple words, public service. For me, public service and how I got involved in politics locally was when I was a teenager. Who would have thought about this in high school? Because we didn't have we had a high school, but there was no gymnasium, and we had to walk a kilometer to get to a, gym, a phys ed class. And I thought, we, it has to be better. Life has to be better. I'll run for mayor one day. So since then, my commitment to public service is still ongoing, and it's expanded. And I've yet to, and, and so I encourage young people, I encourage others, what does public service mean to you? It means different things to everyone, from, from academics to scientists to police officers to social services and, and, and grocery store owners. The list goes on. It's the ability to help improve quality of life for someone else. By doing that, we can all have that relationship, the connection. And, and that's what encourages me to, to continue to, to try to get out of my, when I'm not in a good state of mind and wanting to, to say, what, what am I doing? But to get moved beyond, to get moved beyond the self and, and just keep on trying because there's somebody, somebody, there's always someone who will look up to you, that someone that you didn't think would look up to you. And so that's where prayer and hope comes in quite a bit. So thank you. Thanks, Georgina. And, and thank you to all of the panelists for all your great input. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed this. And uh, I think it's very apropos to uh, talk a little bit about what might be some great next steps forward. So 
one of the Canadian Catholic, well, the Canadian Catholic social justice uh, organization that we have is called Development and Peace. We're going to bring it up here on the screen so that you can see. If you don't know about Development and Peace, um, it was created in response to the Second Vatican Council when the bishops from all over the world came together and the Canadian bishops really saw firsthand, heard firsthand experiences of um, the, the suffering and the poverty and the disparity and, and the lack of, of justice uh, in so many other countries um, in the global south. And so Development and Peace was formed uh, in response to that. And so it's a, a lay-led movement uh, with, in, in partnership with the bishops and they work to help to teach Catholic social teaching, um, to raise funds to give to these global partners, do education for Canadian citizens here. So this is their web page. If you type uh, development and peace in Google, it will pop up or the website is bevp.org and you'll come to this is their uh, home site. Um, can you just scroll down Celeste a little bit so people can get a sense. So they always have the top stories, what's going on um, in, in, their, in their world. Um, and if you scroll up to the top and click on get involved, the tab right in the middle and go to the annual campaign. Oh yeah, perfect. So no, no, this is good, sorry. So get involved. So they always have a fall campaign. That's a little bit of education. Um, helps to introduce and put some education around what's the theme, um, particular case studies and firsthand experiences of the local partners in the Global South. So getting to hear their voice and, and having them be able to speak about their reality in a meaningful way. So there's always that. Um, and then in Lent they have, um, it's like a follow-up, um, campaign and so it's based on fundraising but it again nurture continues to nurture that education but also brings in a um, more spiritual aspect so there are prayers that are in prayers reflections um, like theological reflections and uh, there's always like a stations of the cross in Lent that comes out so a way for us to develop our awareness of our sisters and brothers all over the world um, to take time to reflect on our own experiences and our own actions and how we can um, how we can continue to form and shape our lives so that we are um, more in line with Catholic social teaching. And if you scroll down a little bit, there's some resources there. Those of you who are teachers or have um, the uh, the ability to interact with um, others. There's join a just youth group, Catholic schools, think fast, uh, and then there's advocacy and international experiences. Work with us if you want to work with them. They're a great great organization. I worked for them for a little bit and uh, just really really excellent. If you scroll back up to the top, please, and click on the share lunch, share love. That's their um, theme for this year, and. If you click, so there's a, a video here that introduces uh, Pope Francis talking about Fratelli Tutti. Um, what does he, how does he call us to live this, live this calling, this vocation, priest, prophet, and king, our baptismal vocation. How do we live that out? And then if you scroll down a little bit more, the get involved. So they have created a calendar. Um, you can click on that. And this is a great tool that each day of Lent, um, there's a different action item. It might be a prayer, it might be a video to watch, it might be an opportunity to learn about one of the local partners. Um, there might be an act of solidarity, so a, a meal that you can share or different um, resources that are out there in the world to spend some time engaging with. So it's really interactive. It's a really great tool and I would just really encourage any and all of you to go here and to learn a little bit about development and peace. If you would like to become a member, you can go back up to the top and go to get involved and become a member. Perfect. So um, 
there are there's a it's a lifetime membership it's ten dollars uh, if you're a youth it's free and you can get emails sent to you keep informed you can follow them on facebook on instagram on twitter uh, it's a simple form to fill out and then there is an opportunity for becoming a, a sh share year round donor so that you would give either a one-time lump fee of you know whatever uh, annually or to give monthly um, and the work that they do is totally infused uh, in and throughout with Catholic social teaching uh, everything that they do um, really embodies like everything that we've been talking about um, care for the common good uh, the participation the ability to hear the voice of the poor to enable them to be front and center dialogue all these things that um, that we've been talking about and so I think a really great way to continue this conversation is to engage with the materials here if you do have any questions um, please feel free to send myself an email or um, Gertrude or um, anyone else that you know that's involved with development and peace. I think I saw a lot of you who are either members or uh, have worked for development and peace. So you can definitely reach out there. And uh, I just, again, want to thank you all for coming. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for giving up an evening to listen to all of us talk. <laughs> And I, I, I really hope that, um, that the spirit has uh, planted some seeds in your heart and in your soul so that we can continue this great work that Pope Francis is uh, encouraging us to do. So uh, there will be any resources and um, the questions that we have talked about uh, they have been captured in the chat and those will be saved and can be sent out to um, to all of you who are participating and we would invite you if you are interested in more of these kinds of uh, conversations to happen please check out the center for faith reason and peace if you would like to get on a mailing list for the western conference for social justice i will give you my email and you can email me and i'll add you to our list i just have to make sure that i spell it right we've done this before Okay, there it's there. And uh, with that, I will uh, bid you all adieu and have a wonderful evening. Thanks and God bless everyone. Bye. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thanks. God bless. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Have Happy a great rest night. of your Lent. Good to see you. Good night, everyone. Bye. Oh, there's so many great people here. It makes me so happy. <laughs> that was great. I love listening to everyone say goodnight. That was so nice. <laughs> so cute. Just warms my heart. <laughs> <laughs>